we've postulated, and we probably have a good intuitive sense that there's some relationship between the temperature and the heat which we add to a substance. Certainly if we put a fire under this beaker here, we're gonna see the thermometer rise, temperature is gonna increase as we transfer more heat energy to it. Well, the way that we're going to relate these is by using a convenient fact that frequently the amount of increase in temperature for every unit of heat energy, so every joule that we add here, is going to be constant. So however much energy it takes to increase this from 90 to 91 degrees, it's going to be the same energy it takes to increase this from 91 to 92 degrees. And so this constant we call the heat capacity. It's going to be equal to the ratio of the heat energy we put in divided by the amount of temperature change we get back in return. Now in actuality, this isn't quite constant. It will tend to, to vary somewhat. And when we change phases, so when we boil water and convert it from water into gas, then this equation doesn't work at all. We, the heat energy doesn't go into changing the temperature anymore. It goes into rearranging the structure of the molecules. But over certain ranges, this is a, a pretty good approximation for a lot of materials. Now, unfortunately, in order to use this equation for a system, we would have to go ahead and measure it every time, figure out exactly how much temperature change corresponded to however much heat energy that we added. Now, it's really convenient to instead define the specific heat capacity, and this is the amount of heat capacity we get per unit mass of some substance. So now we no longer have to measure our system here. We just have to measure the mass of you know, whatever substance it is that we're working with. And we'll divide that by our other constant. And so this is the specific heat capacity. The amount of heat divided by the amount of mass divided by the change in temperature and now if we want to know the, the heat capacity here, all we have to do is multiply however much mass we have times this, and that will give us our heat capacity. Here's a pretty useful question. How much energy is required to warm a cup of tea from 22 degrees Celsius, about room temperature, up to 98 degrees Celsius, almost boiling? Maybe we are a microwave manufacturer and we need to know how much energy our machine has to be able to dump out into these cups of tea and coffee that people are going to be putting into the device. Well, to figure this out, we need to start by looking something up in a table. We're going to need to look up the specific heat of water. For simplicity, you're just going to assume that this tea is basically pure water. Now, in truth, all those different compounds we've mixed in are going to affect its properties, it will affect its density, it will affect its heat capacity, but probably it's not going to push it way far off from this value. So we'll, we'll go ahead and stick with this. We'll be happy with a, a rough estimate here. And so now we can use our specific heat capacity equation. This is the one we're going to want to use where we have you know, some quantity of substance. So here we have 250 grams of water and this equation will make it really easy to figure out the heat capacity and the relationship with the heat energy and the change in temperature. So we don't have to measure anything else besides this mass, we just throw that in. So I'll go ahead and solve here for Q and I'm going to be in the habit of labeling the subscripts in all of these because we're going to see that Sometimes we have different Q's and we have different M's and delta T's and definitely don't want to get those mixed up. So substitute into this equation, heat capacity, the mass of the water, about 250 grams for one cup, and the change in temperature. Now remember whenever you have this delta here, you always take the second value minus the initial value. 
So we started out at 22 and went to 98. So we'll take the final value, the 98, subtract the initial value, the 22. And we multiply this all out. Grams will cancel, degrees Celsius will cancel, and we'll get joules, about 7,900 joules. Now this is about equal to the amount of kinetic energy that a car would have driving down the freeway at you know, 60 miles an hour. So this is a, a lot of energy that it takes to warm up our cup of tea. And that has to do with the fact that water molecules have relatively strong intermolecular interactions and attractions to each other. So it takes a, a lot of energy to get them vibrating and separating. Our general methodology for analyzing the motion of heat between different substances by, based on the physical properties of the system is going to be called calorimetry. And usually the physical properties that we're, we're analyzing, we're looking at the temperature to determine the transfer of heat. So a general setup we have our, our system that we're interested in, and so we place it in our calorimetry device, called a calorimeter, and we measure the change in temperature as heat flows from our system into our calorimeter device, and that will let us infer what heat energy was originally present in our system. The first calorimeter was invented by our father of chemistry, of modern chemistry anyway, Antoine Lavoisier in the 18th century. He was interested in doing some biological experiments. So he wanted to figure out how much energy was involved in say, respiration. So his device looked a lot like this. It was surrounded by packed snow and had a funnel on the bottom. And so as the snow melted, he would collect water and measure how much water had been released because it because of the energy transferred to the ice and then they would put uh, originally a guinea pig inside of the device and you know, measure the heat energy released by the guinea pig as it performed its biological chemical reactions of respiration. Now our underlying principle for this calorimeter is conservation of energy. Our conservation of energy says energy can never be created or destroyed, so if we take the energy change of our system and the energy change of the surroundings, i.e. all the energy in the universe, the total is going to wind up being zero. So we can go ahead and subtract the energy change of the surroundings on both sides. So our change in energy of system is going to be equal to minus the energy change of the surroundings. And if we don't do any work here, so we don't have any you know, gases escaping doing compression expansion work, then this is just going to be zero. And so our change in energy is going to be equal to Q. So we'll have, so we can write this as Q system and Q surroundings. And this is going to be our kind of guiding insight here. So we can figure out the Q for the, the water, which is our surroundings here. And then minus that will be Q of our system, whatever we had placed in this calorimeter. So in general, whatever our Q in is, is going to be equal to minus our Q out. And that's just conservation of energy. Suppose we want to figure out the heat capacity of a substance, its specific heat capacity. It's pretty useful and we can use it in any other calculation involving heat transfer into and out of that substance. So what we do is we take a 126 gram piece of copper, we'll try and find a heat capacity of copper, and to make sure we know what its temperature is, we'll put it in boiling water. This water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, it's a pretty easy way to make sure we have a regulated system that doesn't go out above this temperature or below this temperature. So we let it equilibrate and reach 100 degrees C, and then we transfer it to 100 milliliters of water that we have in some thermally insulated container. And we note that the temperature of this water now increases from 24 Celsius up to 32.1 Celsius. 
Now that should allow us to determine what the specific heat of copper metal is in general. So we can start by just jotting down our heat capacity equations. In this case, we're gonna to need to use two equations because we're having heat transfer between the water and the copper. So both have their own heat capacities. And so heat capacity of the water, heat capacity of the copper. And according to what we figured out from conservation of energy, the amount of heat which goes out of the copper is going to be equal to minus the amount of energy which goes into the water. What that's going to let us do is couple these two equations together. So we can now go ahead and use substitution and substitute for the Q water here all of this and for the Q copper here all of this to get all of our equations together. And so now we have this equation. Heat capacity of the water times the mass of the water times the change in temperature of the water equals negative heat capacity of the copper times the mass of the copper times the change in temperature of the copper. Well, now we can take our expression and solve for the unknown quantity, which is the heat capacity of the copper. So go ahead and rewrite this for heat capacity of the copper just by dividing the negative mass of copper, change in temperature of the copper on both sides. And we can plug in the values here. And we look up the heat capacity of water, 4.184 joules per gram degree Celsius. We had 100 milliliters of water, so its density is one gram per milliliter. That will get us into grams here. And remember we take the final temperature minus the initial temperature. So our system equilibrates 32.1 degrees Celsius and we subtract our, our starting temperature of 24 degrees Celsius. Now we can move down here to the, the copper. We had 126 grams of copper. We also finished at 32.1 degrees Celsius for this, this whole system, but the copper started off at 100 degrees Celsius before we doused it in the water. Now if we check here, grams should cancel, degrees Celsius should cancel, uh, but then grams reappears here and degrees Celsius reappears here. So we get the units we want for heat capacity, joules per quantity of substance per amount of temperature. And in this case we get 0.396, which is pretty close to the actual value for the heat capacity of copper. Being chemists, of course, we're very interested in using this technique of calorimetry in the application of chemical reactions, figuring out the change in energy that occurs when we perform a reaction. So we're gonna have our reaction we place in the calorimeter and the heat from the reaction is going to transfer into the water. Now we're gonna be able to measure the heat change of the water using our thermometer and then applying what we know about the heat capacity of the water to get that change in temperature back into quantity of heat. So we'll start out by finding the heat change for the water. Having done that, now we're gonna say that the heat which came into the water is about equal to minus that from the reaction. Now this does make an assumption here, which is that the only heat capacity we have to worry about is all the water in the system, that there's not any heat stored in this reaction. So we aren't really gonna wanna have you know, a large vessel here, which is gonna have its, its own heat capacity contribution. But if we just have molecules actually mixed in with this water and reacting, they're probably not gonna have much heat capacity and so then all of the heat that they produce is going to get released into the water. They're not going to be able to store it themselves. So in that case, this assumption will be true. If we generate a lot of product or if we have you know, some other stuff in the system besides the water, then we're going to have to account for it. We're not going to be able to use this approximation. Now our 
final observation then is because we're at constant pressure, that means change in enthalpy is equal to amount of heat transferred in or out. So that makes it really easy then to figure out what the enthalpy change of our reaction is. We can do this with a thermometer, which is awesome because otherwise this is a really complicated idea. All the change in energy from bonds breaking and reforming into different substances. Let's say that we have a acid base reaction. And so we'll take 50 milliliters of one molar sodium hydroxide and 50 milliliters of one molar hydrochloric acid. And we mix these together thoroughly so that they can fully react. And we take measurement of the temperature change of this mixture. And we find it increases from 21 degrees Celsius up to 27.5 degrees Celsius. And what's going to be the enthalpy change of the reaction? And in this case, I'll ask for it in kilojoules per mole of HCl. And this is a really useful way to specify it because then for any other reaction, we just have to calculate how many moles of HCl are involved and then multiply them by this quantity and we'll get the total amount of energy that we expect to be given off or absorbed. So first thing we're going to want to do here is we're going to want to find the heat transferred into water. And the reason that we're starting there is because that's the only place to start. Our thermometer is immersed in the, the water and we know how much water we have so this is what we can actually look for. Now in this case, go ahead and make an assumption. We'll assume that our mixture is approximately pure water. That's not going to be fully true, so our answer is not going to be entirely precise. But, you know, the vast majority of the content of what's inside of our container is going to be water molecules. And then we have, you know, a mole or much, much less than a mole, about a twentieth of a mole of NaOH and of HCl. So hopefully they, they don't affect things too much. So let's just pretend we have 50 milliliters of, of water and 50 milliliters of water being added together. And we'll multiply by the density of water to get this into grams of water. So approximately 100 grams of H2O is hopefully what we have. Now we can go ahead and figure out what the heat transfer is gonna be because now we know the mass and we can look this up and we given the change in temperature. So I'll go ahead and plug all of that in. Heat capacity of water times the mass of the water and our final temperature minus our initial temperature. You'll find that grams cancels and Celsius cancels to give us joules. So 2719.6 joules of energy has apparently been released into the water in this container. Well assuming that all the heat leaves the reaction molecules then it's going to, then all the heat that went into the water must have come out of the reaction and there was nothing left over in the reaction so our heat of reaction is going to be minus 2719.6 joules now this reaction doesn't generate any gases so it doesn't affect the pressure which means we can use our wonderfully simple constant pressure equation that the change in enthalpy equals the amount of heat going into or out of the system. So in that case, the enthalpy change for this reaction is minus 2719.6 joules. Now that's for our very specific case where we have this one molar 50 milliliters of HCl and one molar 50 milliliters of NaOH. Now let's go ahead and turn this into a more general number. So we'll divide by our total quantity of moles of HCl. And so we had one molar concentration, so it's one moles per liter times the, the 50 liters of HCl we started out with to give us moles of HCl. And we come up with negative 54.4 kilojoules per mole of HCl. Is the amount of energy you get out of doing this acid-base reaction. All right. So what are we going to do in a case where we have a reaction that actually does produce or consume gases, so the pressure is not constant? In that case, we're not going to have our, our wonderfully simple equation that the change in enthalpy of the reaction is going to be equal to the amount of heat released from the reaction. So in that case, what we're going to have to do 
is an experimental kind of kludge. We're going to perform the reaction in what's called a bomb. And this is going to be a container which cannot change volume in any appreciable way. It's actually pretty hard to, to create a container like this. You have to worry about the energy from the reaction heating it up and then it thermally expanding. But let's say we have some very brilliant engineers who are capable of making this bomb for us. Now since it can't expand at all or contract, the change in volume is going to be zero, which means the, the work is going to be zero. And so all the energy released from our reaction is going to take the form of heat energy. It's going to be measurable by our thermometer. So for our energy expression, we just get delta E is equal to Q. And now our setup is going to be very similar to what we have previously. So we have our calorimeter device and the heat energy is going to be released from our reaction. It's going to be a little bit different here. It's going to be released into our bomb and then our bomb is also going to release some energy into the surrounding you know, system of water jacket that we have here. And so in this case, we're going to, to need to know this contribution to the heat capacity. We aren't going to be able to ignore it. And overall heat capacity will be this heat capacity plus the surrounding heat capacity. But if we know that, then we can go ahead and, and proceed in a very similar way to what we did where we had the constant pressure calorimeter. So we'll start by finding Q calorimeter for the whole system, the amount of heat that goes into the system. Having done that, then we know that the change in energy of our system is just equal to the amount of heat energy that was observed. And then finally, the change in energy of our reaction is then going to be equal to minus the change in energy of our calorimetry device due to conservation of energy. An example of a reaction where we would need to use the bomb calorimetry technique is the combustion of monomethyl hydrazine. This is a, a rocket fuel. React with oxygen in order to produce nitrogen, carbon dioxide, and H2O on gas. We have a, a lot of gas being generated here. And that's going to increase the, the pressure of our system if it's a sealed system. So we're not going to be able to use our constant pressure calorimetry technique. We're going to have to use our, our bomb calorimetry technique. Now let's say that according to this reaction, we take four grams of our monomethyl hydrazine and we, we go ahead and react it. Now we know something about our calorimetry device here. We know that including the bomb and perhaps even all of this, it has a total heat capacity of 7.794 kilojoules per degree Celsius. And when we perform this combustion, it increases in temperature from 25 degrees Celsius to 39.5 degrees Celsius. So what's the change in energy of the reaction in this case? And I'll ask for it in units of moles of CH6 in two. Okay, well, we'll start by figuring out what the amount of heat was that was released into our calorimeter system. And so now we're just going to use not the specific heat capacity, but just the, the total heat capacity. And that's equal to the amount of heat which goes in divided by the change in temperature. So that will be our 7.794 kilojoules per degree Celsius times 39.50 degrees that we finished with minus the 25 degrees Celsius we started at. We get a total of 113 kilojoules of energy that has been released into our calorimeter by this combustion. Now we know that the change in energy of the calorimeter is just going to be equal to the amount of heat that went into it since it's not allowed to do any work, can't expand or contract. So our total energy change inside the calorimeter is 113 kilojoules. And now by conservation of energy, that change in energy of the calorimeter corresponds to the change in energy of our reaction. So change in energy of the reaction is equal to minus change in energy of the calorimeter 
is going to be equal to minus 113 kilojoules of energy. Then very lastly, we'll convert that into a molar quantity. So we'll divide by our moles of monomethyl hydrazine down here. So our change in energy altogether is minus 113 kilojoules. And our moles of monomethyl hydrazine, we had four grams of it. Divide by its molecular weight to 46.1 grams per mole. And all together, this comes out to minus 1300 kilojoules per mole. So our reaction is going to release 1300 kilojoules for every mole of monomethyl hydrazine that we combust.